Hey guys, thanks so much for, for having me. I really appreciate being here. Um, to, to start off, I'm, I'm going to say a prayer, but go, I'm going to go ahead and answer a question I got. It's uh, how, how can you be a, a Christian and, and hit somebody uh, for a living? Um, and so how can you be a Christian and hit somebody for a living? For me, it's, uh, it's a competition. It's a platform. Um, it's using different gifts and talents that, that God gives us. And I think there's different spiritual gifts, and I think there's one, the spiritual gift of laying on of hands. Um, isn't, that, isn't that right? So, uh, so at least that's the way I interpret it. I don't know if that's correct. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyways, that's, that's just kind of a fun answer. But um, let's, let's pray. Um, God, thank you so, so, so much for today. Um, that, Lord, we all woke up um, today. Lord, I know a prayer in the Congo that I hear often is, Lord, thank you for letting us wake up today. Remember those who didn't and the families who woke up today missing a loved one. And so, God, uh, just thank you that every day isn't promised, um, but, Lord, that you gave us a new day, um, that you filled our lungs with breath this morning, that uh, we have a beating heart in our chest, a thinking mind um, in our heads, and that, Lord, uh, we just, um, yeah, we have life. Thank you so much for, for breathing life into us today. Lord, let us live our lives for you. Let us live our lives to love others, to love your kingdom, to love you, Lord, to serve you well, to serve your kids. And Lord, just thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, please speak through me today with my testimony. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, yeah, guys, some of you have, have heard my, some of my story, uh, a lot of my story, and um, some haven't. And so I'm just going to uh, share and, and shoot from the hip or, or share from the heart um, and just let you guys know that uh, I grew up getting um, very heavily bullied um, from third grade to eighth grade uh, in specific. Those were like the, it started before that and it ended after that, but um, I grew up with a, a bit of a speech impediment. Um, I had a, a speech therapist from kindergarten until sixth grade. Um, it's actually the reason why I found fighting was uh, whenever I found the UFC, the VHS tapes, um, I thought, these guys don't get bullied. Um, and I thought uh, if I could uh, defend myself, if I could, and then I fell in love with the, the sport, the chess match of it. I absolutely loved um, that it would combine the Olympic sports of judo and wrestling and boxing, and, um, and it would put it all into one sport with, uh, with kickboxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and it put it all together. But growing up was, was, was kind of tough. Um, I sat at the lunch table by myself. I got pelted in the back of the head with chocolate milk spit wads or food um, or fist. Uh, and I just remember one time in specific, just uh, I went to um, middle school and I had this middle school crush. She was the biggest crush I had, whether it was elementary, middle school, high school. Um, and I just remember really um, wanting to impress uh, Jennifer on her birthday. And so Jennifer's dad worked at Dr. Pepper. Um, he was like an executive over there. Uh, her birthday party was a costume contest. And I found out that uh, Jennifer loved Transformers. And so everyone was talking about what they were going to wear to her party because it was a costume contest. And the winner was going to get a prize. And so people were going to go as Batman and Superman and Iron Man and all these different things. But I knew she loved Transformers. Um, and I knew that her dad worked at Dr. Pepper, that their living room was decorated with vintage Dr. Pepper stuff. There was a Dr. Pepper machine in the, in the living room. Uh, everyone at school thought it was really cool that uh, you didn't even have to pay, you just push the button, it pops right out. Um, and so uh, I, I remember getting ready with my mom and my mom telling me, uh, uh, you know, hey, let's go big. You're trying to catch her eye. Uh, and so she helped me, uh, being a good mom from Crowley, Texas. Um, we, we got some duct tape, um, and we made myself a Dr. Pepper transformer from head to toe. My idea was let's go as Dr. Optimus Pepper, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and let's really impress her. And I remember uh, planning out with, with, with different people from school and, and going to the party uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, and getting there, and Mimi opened the door. It was her grandmother. And Mimi opened the door and goes, uh, Jennifer, actually, let's just go ahead and say, in, in the book, 
Uh, her name is Jennifer. In real life, it was Michelle. So anyways, that's why I wanted to say Michelle just then. Um, but uh, Michelle said that, um, uh, or Mimi opened the door and goes, Michelle is going to love this. She's going to absolutely love um, uh, this, this costume. So I walk in, and I get to the living room, and the rumors at school are true. The, the, the machine's there. I push the button. It pops out. I walk to the backyard with a, with a Dr. Pepper shield in one hand and a Dr. Pepper in the other. It was actually a Dublin Dr. Pepper, if you guys remember that. Um, and so I walk into the backyard, open the door, um, and whenever I open the door of the backyard, I'm, meted by my, I'm greeted by my peers, and I'm hit with a couple of flashes of light, um, and I, my eyes adjust, and I notice that nobody else has dressed up at all. It was just me. Um, yeah, and, and I, I remember uh, Michelle saying, I can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. Um, right next to her, uh, a guy named Tyler said, um, uh, you're worthless. And then next to, to Michelle on the other side, a guy named Justin, who was my notorious middle school bully, had the same name as, I, as me, and, uh, and uh, we also had a similar last name. And it was hard to, to escape him whenever we, we lined up um, alphabetical order or sat at the tables alphabetical order. And I remember him saying, um, and he was the one that organized the whole thing and, and, and planned it out and even, even to the point to where the, the, the invitation said costume contest, winner gets a prize. Um, so it was very premeditated. I remember him saying, you should just kill yourself. Um, and so at 13 years old, I started the biggest battle of my life, which was against depression um, and suicidal ideation and a suicide attempt. And so I, I don't think a lot of people understand that today especially, um, bullying is, is through the roof. Um, it's, especially with social media, um, teen addiction, depression, suicide, it's all gone through the roof. Um, it's, it, it's wild. Um, and so I had a heart to, well, let's go back to where I'm, I'm there as that kid. I was crushed. I was absolutely uh, devastated. And I remember whenever I found, it was only a few weeks later, um, when I found the UFC, um, that actually gave me a glimmer of hope. Uh, I, was, I was in a very dark place, and that actually gave me a little glimmer of light, where I was like, if I could be one of those guys, if I could fight, um, then I won't feel worthless, I will be good enough, um, and I won't have to kill myself. Uh, I remember thinking that, that, that that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. And so I, I ended up doing that. I started pursuing wrestling, became a, a, a 10-time state champion in wrestling for Texas. I had two Olympic gold medalists as my high school coaches, Kenny Monday and Kendall Cross. Um, and they, they mentored me. They loved me. Um, they inspired me. Um, and they instilled discipline in me to work hard um, and to achieve these goals. So he told me to write down some of my goals. And um, at first he said state champion. I ended up doing that. And then national champion. Um, ended up writing down national champion, putting it above my bed, uh, putting my two favorite wrestling moves, just clipping it out of a magazine, a picture of it, and putting my favorite wrestling move on the left and my second favorite wrestling move on the right. And my coaches started teaching me about visualization and that you should really uh, see it in your mind. And, and you'd see a wrestling match in your mind a hundred times before you ever go out there and you do it and you try to make that vision come to life. Well, um, the first national championship I won was with the move on the left. The second national championship I won was with the move on the right, um, and, which was pretty cool to see their, their coaching and everything like just come to fruition, uh, to, to come reality. But at, at 19 years old, 18, I graduate and went straight to the Olympic Training Center out of high school. Um, then from the Olympic Training Center, went to Iowa State University. There I, I received it. Actually, at the Olympic Training Center, I injured my elbow. When I injured my elbow, I broke it, dislocated it, tore the ulnary collateral ligament, and there, there, were, uh, there was a 30% chance that I'd be able to compete again. Uh, whenever that happened, I, my identity was taken from me, was stripped from me. That's... That's all I had um, was wrestling, was, was fighting professionally. Like, that was the goal, and I hadn't even fought yet. I um, had, had, had broken the elbow, dislocated it, tore the ulnar collateral ligament, and I, I got hooked on opiates. 
I got hooked. Uh, I had to wait four months to get surgery. Um, and, and during that time, I got hooked on Oxycontin and Oxycodone, the, the extended release and the quick release. Um, and I had three doctors in three different states um, that eventually, after surgery, uh, going from here in Texas to re from recovery to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado to Iowa, I had doctors in three different places that were just giving me pills. I would get 60 from one, 90 from another. Sometimes I get 120 from another. Um, and, uh, and that addiction just overtook my life. Um, one example is my best friend called and said, I can't believe you missed my wedding. Um, I can't believe my best man didn't show up. It was because I was on an eight week long drug binge where I just took off, I disappeared uh, in the mountains of, of, of Colorado um, and I was hitchhiking. Um, and so I was that far gone to where on the outside looking in, um, I might have had uh, everything I had ever wanted. Um, that childhood dream of becoming a fighter had become um, a reality. Uh, I mean, I, after, after the injury, I was hiding an addiction throughout my fighting career. So at 19, I started fighting professionally. At 21, I was on a reality TV show called The Ultimate Fighter. Um, uh, six, uh, 23, 6.8 million people tuned in uh, to watch um, some of our fights, uh, one of my fights, and I couldn't go to the grocery store without taking pictures with uh, someone in the aisle. Or, and so everything looks great in front of all the lights, and, um, but I had kickboxed in Amsterdam, I had wrestled in Moscow, I'd been the main event at the Hard Rock Casino in Las Vegas, um, but something was still um, empty. I, I was still empty. Uh, my heart was still empty. Um, I remember getting my hand raised and I would think, uh, is this all? Um, is this it? I, <laughs> And I say that, and I don't want to just gloss over that real quick, because honest to goodness, I would be standing in the cage. The, this, the, the fight that you guys got to see was after the life change that, that Christ came in and, and loved the hell out of me and blessed the mess out of me. You can see me smile and talk with purpose. Um, but before that, I, I remember getting my hand raised and just being completely dumbfounded that it wasn't fulfilling that I would be thinking before the fight was over, or before I was out of the cage, and even with my family to celebrate, I'd be thinking, well, what's next? Um, I'd be thinking about the party and the drugs that I was gonna be using to fulfill me, to numb myself. Um, and so it was, a, it was a very dark time until I was 23, and this youth pastor just started to pursue me. Just started to pursue me and say, um, hey, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. Um, you aren't the ultimate fighter, but Jesus is the ultimate fighter. He came and he lived the perfect life. He fought the perfect fight, and he did that for you. And he will give you the greatest victory you've ever won, and you didn't win it for yourself. He won it for you, and it's a free gift. And I remember him just talking my language, um, and saying that I need to tap out, uh, that, that, that you need to give up. And for me, tapping out equals defeat. Uh, why, why, would I, you know, why, would, why would God ask a man to tap? You don't give up, you don't quit. Um, and I remember having these conversations with him. If I give up, that's, that's, that's the last thing that I'm gonna do. That's the last thing that I think God would want me to do. And he said, this is the one time that you tap out you're given the greatest gift you've ever been given, and it's not just a one-time tap out. It's a, it's a daily surrender. It's a waving the white flag. It's saying, God, I can't do this without you. And I, I went on this men's retreat, and I remember the, the men that were there. It's a, it's a great ministry. It's a, a local ministry. It's called Fellowship of the Sword. Um, it's a men's retreat called Quest. And so I was on Quest 101, and I went out there, and these guys were just... It was like they were loving God um, first, and out of that, whenever they loved the men around them, uh, 
it was like God's love just flowed out of him onto me. And that was the first time I'd ever been around a group of Christian men that I think were actually, um, I don't want to judge in that way, but for me at that time, it resonated that these men were the real deal, um, that these are Christian men. And for me, before that, um, you know, Chad's uh, talking up here, and, 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 and God has a fight for us to fight. He has a, a life for us to live. He has an adventure for us to go on. He, he has all this incredible stuff. But at that time I said, um, and on the t- retreat I used for the first three days, and I remember saying, um, guys, I, I just don't think sitting around a fire, holding hands, seeing kumbaya, that that's an answer for me. I have a real problem, and I need a real answer. And I remember um, Jeff looking me in the eyes and saying, look, real people with real problems really need a real God with real answers and real solutions. And I promise you, if you let him, he will really show you that he loves you. And if you let him, he will really come in and love the hell out of you. He will bless the mess out of you. And so it started to soften my heart. My heart of stone was replaced with a heart of flesh or or my heart was pierced um, by some of these words and and knowing that God had a, a plan and a purpose for me. One of the verses I found on that trip was 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. And it says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. And I love this version, the NLT, the New Living Translation. It says, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. And I just, that resonated with me so much. It's like, man, this entire time, I've been running a race for a prize that was just going to fade away. If I get a world championship, I already had some national championships, but if I, and state championships, and was already all American, but if I got the world championship, the thing that I'm dedicating my life to, a, a prize I still hope to get one day, I fight again, hopefully around May or June or July. It might be at Windstar. Maybe we'll get a wingman group up there. Um, we'll all use our spiritual gifts. Or I, I will. You guys will support it. Um, but, uh, but I, I just remember, um, I just remember love, God's love invading my heart, invading my heart and, and, and turning my life around. Um, like it was a moment in my life where it was like a U-turn took place. Um, and, and God just came in and, 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 and wrecked me. And, and, and changed my life. And, and, and so I, I wanted to go through it and say, okay, well, what does God want us to really do with our lives? I mean, what does he really want us to do? Um, and I got to this, and it's in Matthew 22, and it's the most important commandment. And I, I love this because the religious people of the day were trying to trick Jesus. They were trying to, to uh, I don't know, it, it's ridiculous, but here we go. Um, but when the Pharisees heard that that he had silenced the Sadducees, he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees with his reply. They met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally as important. I love, I love that too. Let's don't miss that. A second is as equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then this is powerful. It says the entire law, the entire law and all the demands of all the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love God with all your heart and soul and love people as you love yourself. And so I, I felt like God was creating a, a was doing something inside me to, to have a fight, um, to fight the good fight. Um, 
I ended up going to the Congo as fate would have it. I took off fighting. Um, I gave my life to Christ and felt like God asked me to sacrifice a year from fighting professionally to deepen my relationship in him, uh, to build a new foundation, um, and to get my life right and get things in order and to rebuild relationships. Um, and so I started doing that. And as I did that, God took me to the Denver Children's Hospital, to my youth group, to at-risk youth, um, and then into prison ministries and different places. And then he took me to the Congo and gave me a second family with the pygmies. Um, and it was just wild. The pygmies, average height, it was only four foot seven. Four foot seven on average. Um, and so I'm going to show a, a quick... Actually, I spent a little more time on the, the testimony part, which is fine. So I have a video that, that we could play, but it's, um, we're actually going to skip over that. What I'll do is I'll show some pictures um, real quick. And so now I'm trying to fight for something much bigger for my, than myself, and that's these people. Uh, this is the Mabuti Pygmies. And so who, who knew on the top left that a grandmother, one of her funnest gifts to get would be a, just a family portrait because she's never seen a picture of herself, her family, anyone before. Um, the chief is down there on the right with a spear. The kids up at the top right, I just absolutely love them. Um, this is little Mo. Um, she's filling my beard. She had never seen a guy with a beard before. Um, I, we've got a book, and my book is to try to give them a voice. Um, and this is what we were able to do. But I, I love this quote. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That's an African proverb, and I think that that's a great highlight of the element groups that you guys have going on. It's, and, and as men, we want to go alone. We want to go alone, and we want to go fast. But the truth of the matter is that we need each other. As, as Christian men, we truly, truly need each other. And whenever we depend on one another and, and God and his plan for us, amazing things can happen. This is one of the worst water sources um, I've ever seen, or the worst water source I've ever seen. This was in Mabakulu village, and this was their actual drinking water. Um, in this village, uh, I've... I've buried a friend of mine um, named Captula. Uh, we've seen other little guys under the age of five years old pass here, whether it was little Andy Bo or Babo. Um, and to see what God can do with just willing hearts, willing hearts to say, we're going to fight the good fight. We're going to love people. We're going we're to advance the kingdom. And God, we're going to come together to knock out uh, the water crisis. This is the same exact village. Um, and Mama Miriamo, it's her first time pumping, but it went from this to this. And so that right there, I think, is just a metaphor for what, I don't know, even, even for, for my life, I've never said this before, and I'm kind of just winging it with you guys at Wingman today, but uh, um, that was my life before Christ, and then, and then God comes in with his living water, and he just transforms um, hearts. He transforms lives. He transforms communities. Um, and one thing that I really want the men uh, of wingmen to know is that I really think he wants to start with you. Um, he wants to start with us. He wants to, he wants to transform our lives. And, and the way that we do that is through a relationship with our Heavenly Father, with a relationship with his son, Jesus, and a relationship with the Holy Spirit guiding us, um, teaching us, uh, mentoring us, um, comforting us, loving us, and guiding us. Um, and so I'm, I'm really appreciative to be here today. Um, Fight for the Forgotten, our nonprofit exists um, to, to defeat hate with love, um, is to defend the weak, love the unloved, and to empower the voiceless. We are a nonprofit that works for the Mabuti Pygmies in Congo, this year, we're excited to expand for the Batwa Pygmies in Uganda. Um, there's been 160 people there that are in fear of their people group going extinct. Um, there was over 300 Mabu or Batwa Pygmies in uh, Uganda. They got kicked out of the rainforest, um, and they were put on one acre of land. Over 300 people put on one acre of land. Uh, the, the witch doctors in the area have said, if, 
when people with HIV come to them and say, how can we be cured? They say, go rape a pygmy. Go rape a pygmy and you'll be cured of HIV or go have relations with a pygmy, but oftentimes, most times, it comes through rape. Um, and so now three out of four of those people uh, in the Batwa pygmies in Bundabugio, Uganda, now have HIV, three out of four of them, and they're fearful that their people group's gonna go extinct. So this year, just a prayer from, from you guys would be, our goal this year is to get them back land of their own, um, food, uh, a working farm, and to drill them wells. We were able to do that in Congo, that was the video I was gonna show you, was we were able to get back 3,000 acres of land for the Mobutu pygmies. We were able to empower the locals. I helped drill the first 13 wells. The locals there have now drilled over 70 wells in the Congo, transformed over 70 communities with clean water. Um, and now they have their own, their own farming initiative. We're also bringing Fight for the Forgotten here stateside and we're doing bullying prevention here in the states. We're doing that in public and private schools as well as martial arts academies. And so, uh, guys, I just hopefully have been here just to encourage you guys. I know I've been a little all over the place, but uh, let, me, let me just pray for us um, today. God, thank you so much for today. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you and we need you. Lord, I know in this life it's easy to want to go fast and to go alone. Uh, but Lord, I know that you're asking us to go far. And to do that, we need to go together. Lord, we need to go together with you, following you, following your son Jesus. Lord, help empower us as men to be incredibly um, relentless in our pursuit of you. Lord, let us be... Um, let us be men of courage. Let us be men who, who are followers of Jesus, who just love you, love your son, love your Holy Spirit, and out of that flows love onto the people that are around us. Lord, thank you for wingmen. Thank you for, for, for the movement of God that's coming out of this place. Lord, thank you that I get to be here. Lord, I just pray a special blessing over all the men here today. Lord, would you empower us to go from this place with just your light and your love. Lord, we need your son, Jesus. We need you so much. And so thank you so much that you, that you don't need us, but you want us. Uh, you desire a relationship with us and that you crave that so much that you gave your only son on the cross for us. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, uh, I appreciate it so much, the opportunity to be here and share my story. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.